in preparation for this meeting, I, I had asked uh, our instructors and presenters for the next couple of days to provide me a, an introduction uh, so, I could, so I could give them a proper introduction before their presentation. And uh, Clark Wheeler certainly deserves a proper introduction, uh, although he may not need one. So I, I got from Clark a torn off piece of cardboard with a couple of quick notes here. Uh, Clark, Clark Wheeler is a hometown boy who started in the appraisal business in 1978, and he's seen a lot of water under the bridge. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Clark Wheeler and Associates. <laughs> Um, it's always good to see everyone, and as always, we're very grateful to the uh, appraisal and broker community for helping keep us informed as time goes forward. And we've been fortunate to be able to expand our board and our presentation over the last few years to include farm credit and some other providers in the state. Um, so we appreciate that. And we wanted to remind everybody that Don ran this puppy for long time, right? <laughs> and he kind of got it off and running, and, and I feel like it's really been a benefit for the whole community. And in token of our friendship and esteem, we got him a money clip to keep all his money in, because based on the hospital we're building next to him, I think Don's business because I thought ranchers were closer to God. <laughs> they were more honest, they were easier to work with. And ranch brokers, I think, fall into the same category. So thank you for all your support for 47 years. I'm not retiring from selling branches, so uh, you got somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thank you. Now, Don's the last of the coyote brokers, as I call them. And Miss Susie, we got you a gift certificate for Murphy's because you've done a lot of work for everybody yeah. over the years. I got mixed up. It's under Don's name, but it's yours. What I say, it's a All right, so without further ado, we're gonna, I don't think we lost anybody in the last year. We usually like to give a little prayer that we're all still here to play the game. Um, Andy Ron, as you know, will be giving a presentation. Tom Kingsbury, um, part and parcel, is gonna be doing some GIS and some, how do you say it? Non Non-fungible token. Non token real estate. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> Wade with Farm Credit Services, he's out of their Great Falls branch, and Christine is with Farm Credit Services, and she's out of the Miles City branch. And so um, we always appreciate their input because they like to have real sales. They don't just make it up. You know, so, so as we always remind people, anything we say, they you know, you shouldn't really take seriously as far as Mike and I are concerned because these are just average numbers or trends or what we think we're seeing, but we're not intending to put any specific numbers on anything or make any official representations today. So we appreciate you coming, and I think, oh yeah, do I have a clicker? Roald's got it. Thank you. I guess I get more more to say. <laughs> Which one is it? Just the, the right arrow. Uh, okay. So just a little introduction before we get going. You know, you've, You've all seen this before, our bastardized east-west study of how we think values in Montana have moved over time. And that line over the years as we've worked has moved further east as we've brought more of eastern Montana into what we call the western study. Western study roughly is a more recreationally influenced market, although you can't necessarily say that's not true of eastern Montana as well. Um, <clears throat> this is what I see now is that this thing is bifurcating up, you know, and we've got these counties down here, Gallatin Park, Madison, Beaverhead, and you'll see some of uh, Mike's numbers today. I mean, that's where a lot of this is occurring. 
then you've got you know the valley and the flathead and it's kind of its own world not so many big ranches but we tend to talk about today we're talking about bigger landscapes when i talk later i'll be talking about ranches over 10,000 acres needed because that's a data set that is somewhat consistent um, area four is kind of that you're familiar with that area it's kind of the in between and then five we don't use to get up into the Golden Triangle or into eastern Montana that much, um, you know, but it tends to be its own market. The Yellowstone ecosystem, or is it Bozeman or Big Sky? I'm not sure, but you know, that's the ecosystem area. That's those counties where we're seeing a lot of power. And you know, I found that number. That's about when I decided to quit the business. But there was that many people coming and going to Bozeman in a year. And then we wonder why our market's as screwed up as it is. So I just thought I, there's a bunch of different people that have put out statistics. Um, this is Marcy Collins' numbers. And you know, they're just showing the ridiculous, right? Bozeman's 840, Calgary's 535, Manhattan's $630,000 for the median price of a house. And you look at those kind of gains, Big Sky, $3 million. You know, not surprising. Livingston, Ennis, and then you look at the amount of growth in land in Bozeman. I mean, that 121 percent that's lots in town, you know, or development ground. And that's in the last year. Greater Bozeman would be, you know, your 20s, 5s, those tracks. But this is fueling part of the market, and it's all kind of the same phenomenon. You know, just in the different levels. We're playing at a different level with these ranches. And I'm going to have an analogy later to the Monopoly. That we're kind of playing a Monopoly game right now. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see that. Liquor, gambling, rods, tobacco. What's the Q stand for? <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I kind of already said that. So th this. You know, it's getting really hard with all these pocket listings and non-disclosure agreements to find information. So Mike and I spend a lot of time in the alleys of Bozeman. <laughs> we tend to find some valuable information. Um, you know, as you can see, NDAs suck. You know, a good time called, I don't know, jail, I don't know who that is. But anyway, we, thought we just keep looking in those areas and we found out more than we want to know. So with all that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clark. Uh, I want to reiterate a lot of what he said. Gratitude to the room. Um, you know, there's no event every year that brings as many brokers and appraisers together at once. There's no event that uh, has as many Montana land source subscribers in the room as this event. So. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for Don and Susie for their work. Uh, just kind of flashing back to when I went out on my own as a appraiser, and then also when I rolled out Montana Land Source, Don and that group was very uh, supportive, uh, very appreciative of that. Going to do a quick plug as well for a new emerging Montana Farm and Ranch Brokers Group, and basically the Billings Farm and Ranch Brokers Group, which has been going on almost as long, not quite as long as Don, but a good 30 years. Uh, with COVID, we started to, like everyone else, going to Zoom meetings and whatnot, and then kind of hearing from Don that might be winding down the Bozeman group, we thought, why not make that the Montana group that just happens to be out of Billings, since there's no other broker group out there. So continuing forward, we're gonna have our meetings in person in Billings, of course, but also on Zoom, and we're really trying to get top-notch presenters, especially relevant to uh, legislative issues and uh, you know that kind of stuff so high quality content and become the umbrella organization for farm and ranch brokers across the state and continue to work with the Montana chapter of the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers to build this event up every year and have this be the pinnacle event for brokers and appraisers in the state of Montana. So my name is Andy Ron from Montana Land Source. And if anyone in the room doesn't know, uh, we're the most complete resource um, online for listings and sales. Basically, I go out and find everything possible, 200 acres and up, especially on the listing side, and then of course um, keep them in sales. So I'm tracking all available sources: the MLSs, 
broker websites, advertising venues, even cadastral and social media, and uh, especially word of mouth and just direct contact with ranch brokers. So appreciate all of you that, and appraisers as well, that share information. And we map everything and put it online and the access to our subscribers. And uh, new this year, we rolled out a, a nice newer website and pretty proud of this. We have live market statistics. It's pretty slick. I change something in my database and instantly that pipes forward to the, uh, the website. So never before have land market statistics been available online. So we're pretty proud of that. And um, a lot of the content on our website, my website is free, especially the statistics stuff, but then there's uh, deeper information that's available to paying subscribers. So we've got free subscriptions and then our paying subscription, we call the market expert subscription. And we also offer property advertising. You can advertise your listings on Montana Land Source. It boosts them and it makes it available to larger audience, not just subscribers. And for advertising, you can advertise any size property. Um, the, the data that I track um, exclusively is 200 acres and up, but advertised properties can be any acreage. And this is a clip from our website that's kind of neat. We have the most viewed properties, and you can see the tab up there um, from past week, past month, past year. So that's kind of fun showing which properties get the most interest in traffic. And it's interesting, clearly, the larger acreage last year is what uh, garnered the most hits on the website. So uh, the last two years or 18 months, I've been calling the refugee market. Uh, mid 2020 through 2021 uh, market cycle. You know, we all know it kind of kicked off with COVID and COVID refugees and people fleeing COVID to the safe uh, refuge of Montana. And then there was also kind of a social political refugee function. A lot of brokers that I talked to and, and buyers, uh, sounds like there was kind of a tipping point. A lot of people in California, Washington, other places that were kind of fed up and had been thinking about Montana, dreaming about Montana, but the social protests and the unrest in the cities and stuff seemed to tip a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people just said, that's it, you know, I'm, I'm ready, I'm out. And that really contributed to a wave of interest in Montana land. And the remote worker function, um, we typically think of that more in residential and, you know, wage earner class property, smaller acres, but I think it had an impact even on some ranches, I mean, even high net worth individuals that presumably can work anywhere they want. Nonetheless, even those guys had more mobility perhaps, so I think that contributed. And then finally, especially on the you know really large ranch front and high net worth individuals, a lot of talk about just safe, safe harbor for wealth. Um, sounds like a lot of guys had concerns that there was a target on their back potentially um, as being wealthy individuals, that was a, a factor. And Montana land, you know, was a was a safe uh, harbor for wealth. So I think those are the dominant factors contributing to this incredible market we've seen for 18 months. So I think 2021 is going to go down in history in the, as the hottest market we've certainly ever seen in Montana prior, and maybe ever will see or see for a long, long time. Uh, sales was up about 34 percent in volume over that period of time. Inventories down 50 percent from before this market era before 2021, uh, a lot of older inventory was sold off. Um, and I'm gonna get to some numbers on that later. Um, land values were up. Um, and this was a big change. Before 2020, improved properties for, for at least a decade or two uh, were hit pretty hard in the marketplace. Uh, improvements, especially if they were over-improved on a property you know, saw pennies on the dollar at sale time. And a lot of buyers preferred either vacant land or minimally improved land. Highly improved land was usually pretty heavily discounted. And suddenly that changed, you know, these, these refugees needed a roof. And plus, you know, try to get something built today, you know, try to buy materials, try to get labor, that kind of stuff. So that was a big shift in the market where improved properties. And I think that had something to do with clearing off some older inventory as well old properties that have been on the market for years with big improvements that the sellers weren't willing to discount. And of course, we all know, you know, the record for the highest paid ranches and uh, purchase ranches in Montana was broken twice. You know, the CA, the climbing era went down and then of course the Matador, so twice in the same year, uh, that record was broken. 
And we saw a dramatic increase, and Clark referenced this, you know, off-market transactions, especially kind of the legacy ranch, you know, type properties uh, happened off-market to a high degree. Okay, so getting into some numbers, this is active listings, and this, these years are the number of active listings at the beginning of the year. So you can see our volume, you know, before 2021, typically about 600 properties were on the market at the start of the year. That went down to less than 500 at the start of 2021, and right now we're sitting at about 320 listings on the market. So the inventory has just been taking a dive. And this is asking price per acre. So, you know, in 2020, it's about 1,500 up to 1,700, and we're now 2,300 for the, the, the median ask prices of properties that are on the market today. And again, this is 200 acres and larger across all of Montana. And this is interesting, and this took me kind of a while to sort through. These are median days on the market. So you can see we had 360 in 2020 up to 500. Which, well, how does that make sense? How did days on market increase? Well, from 2020 into 2021, the newest inventory was sold off first, I think. And then a big portion of the market in 2021 was a lot of older inventory. And there, there's inventory out there that's 10 years old. Um, and there's still properties on the market today that long. But a lot of that older inventory got picked off. So that market, this hot market we've had, had a unique impact in that way that we cleaned off a lot of older inventory that I don't think you know would have would have gone away. So here's my map for my east-west line. You know we historically have always talked about kind of drawing a line between Billings and Great Falls. And so these are my county going along county lines, which counties I call western, which counties I call eastern. Um, uh oh well that's too bad uh, this slide didn't come across right because it's supposed to show Western Montana and Eastern Montana and the entire state. What it's showing is the entire state. Um, and I like to go back on this slide all the way back to, uh, and this is volume number of sales per year. And I like to go back to, back all the way to 2005 because that shows the, you know, the peak in the last uh, mark we had and of course the crash. And it's interesting, this, this zone in here, uh, if you saw Eastern and Western Montana, this was dominated by Western Montana. Eastern Montana didn't really participate in that market. It was really a strong recreational market uh, pre-2008, 2009. And then the recovery was uh, actually largely Eastern Montana or the ag lands. Because if you remember, commodity prices were actually pretty good at that time. And the recreational market was just tanked. And then, you know, we just kind of crept along in this recovery. But I mean, look at the, look at the volume over the last uh, two years and the peak of 2021. So the volume of sales was just staggering. And by the end, it's both Eastern and Western Montana. Again, if you can see those uh, layers, they both mirror each other pretty, pretty well. It's not just a Western Montana phenomenon uh, the last two years. This is total acres sold. And I don't often like to use this data because with large ranches in Montana, it can be pretty noisy. You know, you look, you look at through these years, I mean, it definitely does show the crash, but you know, there's a lot of volatility in there because a couple big ranches can really boost this. And by the way, I, I did take out like the timberland, you know, the giant timberland sales, warehouse or that whatnot. But I did throw this in because it does really show, even on total acres, just how we're so much higher in 2021 than ever before. 2020 as well, but then in the 2021. And this is median acre uh, of uh, median price per acre. And this does have, you know, the entire state of Western Montana, Eastern Montana. And, you know, there's some busyness here, especially Western Montana, the last couple of years. But, and it's, you know, it's interesting on a per acre value, um, you know, we're still on par with 2006, 2005. So value, values, you know, over the past 18 months, talking about this market and getting calls and talking to people, I've been much more impacted by the volume story than the, the value story. And you got to understand, too, this is, you know, averaged or median across all property types, 200 acres and up. So there, I think this is capturing a lot of smaller track stuff. You, if you break this down by ranches and by areas, of course, there's different stories with the, uh, the per acre price. 
Now this is really interesting. Um, and one thing unique about Montana Land Source, because I'm tracking listings so uh, so closely, I also have, and I, I leave things in when they're expired and withdrawn, so I have a lot of interesting expired and withdrawn data. So look at this, um, leading up to 2018, 2019, and I talked about this in previous years' presentations, in 2018, 2019, more, so this is percentage of properties leading the market, not selling. They're withdrawn, they're expired, versus what sells. So in 2018, 2019, more properties left the market not selling than sold. And then we saw this drop precipitously, 2020, 2021. But it's interesting, this this climb we saw. And I think, you know, part of the story is this last 18 months has been so dramatic, but the market was pretty strong and growing pretty well, you know, before we got there. And I'm, I'm not sure what to say about this, except that the market was growing. And I think maybe a lot of sellers, you know, were putting stuff out there, but uh, they weren't that motivated. And if they weren't going to get the pricing they wanted, you know, they were willing to, to step out of the market. Um, and then just the high demand we've seen has, has chipped away at that. But in my opinion, even 50%, you think about this market we've been in, 50% of as much as 50% as many properties sold were taken off the market, not selling. So I think it kind of speaks to the seller in, in Montana, uh, not being necessarily that particularly motivated in cases. Um, just how many sellers are willing to, to step out of the market. And I'm gonna get into this too though, and everybody knows a big issue we've had now is there's nothing to go into. A lot of sellers want to have replacement part of property and that's nearly impossible or very difficult in this environment, so. Um, so this is, I think this graph didn't quite come out right either. Average percent of sale price to list price. And so this is the you know this is the, the difference between list price and sell price. And back oops, back in you know 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, we were at about 75%. So the the average was properties that sold would sell at 75% of what they were asking. And we've seen that, you know, that margin diminish as we moved into 2022, which is to be expected, the hotter market. But in this, this does go counter to some uh, beliefs out there. I mean, I've heard a lot over the last year how everything is selling at ask price or even over, and that's true. That certainly happened a lot more, but on the whole, the average is still 92%. So there's still still a lot of properties selling for, for less than uh, less price. And this next graph will show this. So these are two lines. The blue line is the percentage of sales that have sold that experienced a price change. Through their through their listing, so you know we kind of had a dip going into 2020 and it's been rising. So at 2022, 40 percent of the properties out there experienced a price reduction before they sold, and the yellow, uh, the red line is the percent of that price change. So we've seen the the cut in price go down over time, which is to be expected uh, in this market. And this is median days on market of sales um, over the over the years. And you can see, you know, we dipped down to less than a year uh, on the median days on market. Um, it was lower leading into 2017-18, and uh, we're, we're heading back down. I meant to mention earlier, any questions or comments at any time, uh, feel free to, I'm almost done, but feel free to speak up. So I don't know that I've ever made predictions before, but this year I'm feeling bold, apparently. Um, I don't think this is a very, uh, you know, you have to be very astute to make this uh, pre uh, prediction, but the market clearly is gonna be constrained by low inventory. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned before, but the trajectory of inventory lowering, we're still on that trajectory. Um, I didn't mention this either, Montana Land Source puts out a weekly report, the Montana Land Report, that's what you get for a free subscription or a paid subscription to Montana Land Source. So every week, an email goes out on Wednesday uh, highlighting you know, the new activity, new listings, new sales, that kind of stuff. Week after week after week, more properties are leaving the market than coming on. That's still the case. And I've been kind of watching, I kind of, into 2022 and coming into the set, you know, we're early, but you know, coming into the, 
prime listing season, you know, you kind of expect a turnaround. Every week, we're still losing inventory. Uh, both, I think mostly sales, because the, the expireds are down, but um, Clark asked if it was sales or, or withdrawns or expireds. Um, it's both. Um, I had, I've had a couple calls so clearly the, the inventory of being able to roll into replacement property is a huge, huge issue. I've had a couple calls from a couple sellers. They're, they're frustrated, their property, why, why their property didn't move in this hot, they know it's a hot market, why didn't their property move? They want to know why, and they want to talk about everything except pricing. <laughs> and two, two of these guys, they were, just, they were just mad and just frustrated, and they weren't even looking for replacement property, that wasn't their issue, and they just said, I'm out. Um, and I think I, I think my last slide's going to talk about this, just how strong the sellers are in Montana. I mean, I just, people, and, you know, you hear a seller say they're motivated, and it's often a joke. You know, they're motivated at their pricing. It's just remarkable how financially strong uh, sellers are in Montana. I think that kind of defines our market. So we're going to have, I, I just don't see how we're not going to have less volume of sales in 2022. We just don't have the volume. Um, you know, lack of supply, traditional theory would say that's going to put upward pressure on prices. I think that's likely to happen, but I think there's resistance uh, as well. I, from what I hear from direct conversations and, and conversations with brokers on buyers, that they, they want just the right property. There's not a lot of desperation out there. That, you know, there was some desperation and some urgency with the COVID and that kind of stuff. It seems like that's kind of tapered off. There is demand out there. Most brokers say they have buyers if they have the right property, but it sounds like buyers are pretty picky. They want what they want. I think they'll pay uh, strongly if they have the property, but those properties aren't out there. Um, I think we're gonna see more off-market transactions. I mean, I've heard you know some brokers have shared you know some, some impending large legacy ranch transactions. I think we're gonna see more of that it kind of seems like it's a favorable environment for that, for the, the buyers and sellers involved. They just don't have to deal with the public exposure. And so in summary, like I said, I just, I think this really defines the Montana market. You know, sellers are just extremely strong. It's, it's so, it's extremely rare these days to see a true distressed sale. And it's funny, it seems like sometimes what's distressed about a property is family dynamics, right? Family splitting up, but then that becomes a very complicated transaction because you have multiple people involved. So even if they're on the verge of bankruptcy, you'd think that would be a, a desperate sale. We all know properties that have been in that category that's taken a year or two to get done because of the parties involved. And the buyers are discerning, you know, they just they just want the right property. So I just see less buyers and sellers coming together in 2022. Thank you, that's my presentation. Any questions before I pass on to the next speaker? <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know me, <clears throat> my name is Mike McDonald. For those of you who do and haven't asked me, this is my coat. <laughs> uh, but we're going to go ahead and handle the, the land study, typically kind of how we've done it. It's split between East and West, but Christine and Wade have been voluntold uh, this world. Uh, but they're going to split the state up uh, into a couple more regions. Uh, the first thing I'm going to start with is just an overview of the state, but you need to keep in mind that uh, it's really heavily influenced what happened in western Montana, southwestern Montana in particular. We'll get to that as we move through some slides. <clears throat> uh, but we'll go ahead and start off. Uh, this first slide's just 40 acres in size and greater from throughout Montana. I got three years, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021. I thought it would be good to go to back to 2019 because it's kind of pre-COVID, give you an idea what it felt like when things were kind of normal. Uh, we got the number of transactions, volume, both in dollars and acres, and the percentage change in both those measures. So if we look in 2021, we had 503 sales. <clears throat> that number is going to grow. It's just a lag effect as we move through and try to add sales to the database. It just takes time. And as Clark mentioned, it's just increasingly difficult to get these transactions. Uh, we had a little over $1.7 billion in transactions uh, and sold 740,000 acres, more or less. So that was a 43% increase in total dollars and only an increase of less than 16% in total acres. So just a real indication of that upward price pressure. 
2020, pretty similar results. I mean, that was impacted about halfway through the year by COVID and some of the other factors that Andy had mentioned. Uh, we had 1.2 billion, more or less, in sales uh, throughout the state, 640,000 acre. Pretty similar though, about a 40% increase in dollars, uh, came in just about an 18% increase in acres. So uh, both those two years just, you know, does show you that we did have uh, pretty good price pressure. Uh, if you look over in 2019, our average size was about 869 acres. Uh, median sales price was about $550,000. Uh, that was just a really modest increase from 2018, but 2018 was a pretty good year. It seemed like we traded through a lot of really good properties. You know, the demand was still there, but supply was kind of constrained, which uh, seems to be an ongoing theme anymore. In 2020, we moved in, not a lot of change in acreage size, on average 819 acres, uh, but median sales price was up almost 11% to 610,000. Uh, in 2021, though, we did see a pretty dramatic increase in the average size. Again, this is statewide. Uh, median sales price up almost 60% uh, to 975,000. Again, you can't apply this statewide. As, as we go through, you'll see uh, that most of this was Western or Southwestern Montana. Uh, same data, just a different look. Instead of median sales price, we're looking at dollar per acre or dollar per unit measures. Uh, so in 2018, uh, we had an increase of 11% in the median dollar per acre. Sales price, this is land and buildings. Again, the same data sets, 40 acres and above and greater. So I mean, there's a lot of variation, obviously, in property type, location, and whatnot. Uh, 2019, we saw a 51% increase in median dollar per acre sales price. 58% on average. Uh, 2020, uh, we had, uh, or maybe I just mentioned that, 2020, 2019 to 2020, it was 51% median and a 58% increase on dollar per acre uh, purchase price uh, on average. In 2021, we saw 19 and 24, so just again, increasing trends uh, throughout, no matter how you look at it, I guess. <clears throat> we break the data up into different categories in terms of transaction size. This has six different categories. Uh, properties that sold at price points less than five million. Properties that sold at price points between five and one million, one to 2.5, 2.5 to five. Five to 10 and 10 million and greater. We just have 20, 20, 21 up here as a comparison. If we look at the lower end, those properties traded price points less than 500,000. In 2020, they made up about 6% of the dollar volume uh, but 43% of the total sales transactions. If you compare that to 2021, 2% uh, of the total dollar volume and 27% uh, of the total sales transactions. And the larger transactions, you see it's 36% uh, of the $10 million and above. In 2020, is 36% of the dollar volume and uh, only 3% of the sales, total sales in the state. And then if you hop over to 2021, it's 53% uh, of the total dollar volume and 6% of the total sales. So <clears throat> when I look at this, I, mean, I don't have a lot other years included here, but the next slide, do. you can see kind of the lower end of the market's kind of eroding just due to the upward price pressure. Uh, if you look at sales that are $5 million and above in 2020, uh, they represented 7% of the total sales, but 53% of the total dollars. And in 2021, it was 15% of the total sales and 71% of the total dollar volume. Uh, 2020 is the first time that $5 million and above um, was more than 50%. Typically, the lower end was 50% uh, above. This is, so like, <clears throat> if we look at 2018, properties trading at price points at less than $5 million made about 57% of the market. And the properties trading at price points above $5 million made up 43. Uh, pretty similar in 2019. 2020, we get that flip uh, where these lower price point properties are making up less than half. And in uh, 2021, it's a pretty significant difference uh, with properties trading at $5 million or less than $5 million, making up about 30%. And those higher value properties at $5 million and above making uh, about 71%. So I thought it was just kind of interesting how uh, we saw that kind of flip in 2020 and carried through to 2021. Uh, obviously, as we add to our database, these numbers will change some, but I do think that that uh, shift in the dynamics here to stay for a little bit anyways. Also break it up in terms of property size. So again, six different categories. Uh, properties that sold that were 
less than three, 320 acres. Uh, those that are 320 to 640, 640 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, and so on. Um, you know, there's not a lot of difference when you look at these particular categories. So if you look at properties that were less than 320 acres in 2020, it's 61% of the total sales transaction and 15% of the dollar volume. I've got that <clears throat> color switched here, so it might be a little confusing initially, but in 2021, it was 55% of the total sales transactions and 23% of the uh, total dollars. So not a lot of change there. And if you look at the 10,000 acres and above, you know, get 2% of the sales and 27% of the dollar volume. And, uh, you know, again, in 2021, it's 2%. I guess where it gets interesting to me is when you look at it in terms of dollars, uh, dollar per acre values. So this graph shows that same category. You got 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, average purchase prices, it's unimproved land value. On the, the lower end of the market, the smaller properties tends to drown us out, but obviously uh, it's generally increasing trends in all those segments. Uh, the one thing I guess, when you look at the lower, the smaller properties, those less than 320 acres, that uh, jump from 2020 to 2021 was 53% uh, in, on average uh, in these purchase prices. And the larger properties, the 10,000 acres and above, uh, was 57 percent so if you look at those i'm going to break them out here uh, this is the properties that are 320 acres or less than 320 acres um, if you look at 2019 they're about 43 4400 dollars an acre it's bumped up to almost 12,000 in 2021 so that's 166 percent increase um, for that property segment again it's very heavily influenced uh, by western montana and Gallatin valley things like that big sky all that stuff so yeah. Um, but if you were to try to appreciate sales from 2019 or like that data to 2021, you'd have to apply a 63% annual appreciation rate over the two years uh, to catch up with that. On uh, the table shows median sales price of this property size. Uh, in 2019, it was 382,000. It's up about 17% coming out of 2018. 415,000 in 2020, so up about 9%. And in 2021, it's 649, so that shows an increase of 56%. Uh, so a lot of growth. And then these larger properties, the 10,000 acres and greater, pretty similar results. You see in 2019, it was $739 an acre. 2021, on average, it was 15, about 1,500. So that's 103% increase over that two-year time period. Uh, you'd have to appreciate from 2019 to 2021, 42.5% uh, uh, to kind of get 2019 to 2021. <clears throat> Again, I have the median sales price. Uh, you can see in 2019 it was under it was 11 875. It was down 2% from 2018, but again, in 2018, it was a really pretty good year. We cycled through most of the favorable properties. Moving into 2019, still have demand, just not supply. 2020, saw a 31% increase up to 15.6 million. And in 2021, we're up 40, 42% to 22. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, these larger properties really are restricted, mainly uh, in the western part of the state. You have to go maybe to still. I think you can go over to Sweetgrass, and there's one that we have in our database uh, for these larger transactions. This data when Mike was showing us in the meeting is less influenced by buildings. That smaller one that has 166 a lot of buildings in there and buildings are starting to get pretty low but that's more an indication of what your land market has done that you were talking about tonight yeah but again it's like i said we'll show i'll show you some maps it's just it's really heavily influenced by what happened in western Montana. what's causing it i get two answers all the time and they both suck uh COVID <laughs> and yellowstone <laughs> So I looked on the internet and it was kind of funny because they had some Twitter quotes. I like the second one and the last one. The second one says, after watching Yellowstone and moving to Montana, marrying a cowboy and never looking back. And then the last one, it says, I've been watching Yellowstone, thinking about moving to Montana, good old American values and sensible people. I mean, I've watched a couple of those shows. I haven't seen either one of those. <laughs> I feel like going to Camp Crystal Lake to fucking up with the Jason as a counselor. <laughs> but anyway, um, so <clears throat> this is what we're talking about with the disparity in values between East and West. Uh, in Eastern Montana, if we look at 2021, this is a median uh, dollar per acre land values. 
In 2021 in Eastern Montana, median shows like $711. That's up 8% versus a 20% increase in Western Montana. <laughs> if you look at average values in Western Montana, they're up like 19%, so not a lot of difference. Uh, but in Eastern Montana, it shows negative 2%. So essentially, um, you know, you can't really apply everything that I just showed you that's supposed to be an overview of the state to every region of the state. I think you'll kind of uh, become a parent as Christine and Wade move on. But, <clears throat> so this is how we get it. I kind of made a little fancier map. I didn't have any help from Tom. So if you guys want good maps, talk to Tom. But 71% of the sales that I had in this data set came from that area in Western Montana, and 90% of the total dollar volume. So uh, that's predominantly why I'm saying there's more influence. And if you look at the top 20 counties, in terms of uh, dollar volume, that's where they are located. I mean, obviously, Fergus County uh, pops due to its influence, elk hunting, you know, and the snowies and whatnot. And then if you go even further, 71% uh, of the total dollar volume came out of all these five counties and accounted for 34% of the total number of sales. So all the data on these, when you're trying to look at it and generalize it as a state, it's, uh, I guess it's a little deceiving. Just gotta keep in mind that uh, it will be different as we go on. And I think Christine's up next. I typed your name up. I know, I was wondering. Yeah, they're selling real estate between those five counties. Yeah. <laughs> when I was originally told I needed to present and I needed to take up 20 minutes, on Eastern Montana. I'm just going to tell you, it hasn't been that exciting, so I hope you brought some questions because I'm going to need something to drag this out a little bit. But we're going to talk about the 18 counties collectively referred to as God's country. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's going to cover from Petroleum County and Treasure County all the way to the state line south of the Missouri River, and then also from Phillips County over to the North Shore line. There, there's really two themes that I want to express today, and that's going to be market activity and just general trends. So in this top table here, uh, we're just gonna talk about uh, observations on trends, and then I'll, I'll break these down into those three line classes and talk about and show you why I'm drawing those, those conclusions for the most part. But um, this, this portion of eastern Montana, it, it, it's a big portion of the state. There's there's a lot of submarkets there, so these averages really don't tie to one particular area. So this is just a general 30,000 foot overview. Um, irrigated crop, 1250 to 4,000 overall. That's going to catch the majority of the irrigated sales. Now that that's not just the Yellowstone River. That's Milk River, Missouri River, Powder River, Tongue River. So there's there's a big variety of quality in this range. So generally speaking, the Yellowstone River is going to represent the, the upper end of that range, and then your um, the, the smaller streams like the Tongue River and the Powder River, Missouri River, that's going to be more the mid-range, and then um, north Mill River, that's going to be more of this lower part of the overall range. Um, for the most part, Increasing, but not like Western Montana. This is just a lot more vanilla, very moderate. Um, it's been busy, though, that's for sure. Uh, dry crop, 600 to 1300. Uh, there's a big range of quality in that. So upper end of that range is gonna be the far eastern side of the state. That's gonna be uh, some North Dakota influence, Weasel County, Richland County. Middle of that range is gonna be more of your average quality, Macomb County. Dawson County, and then uh, you know, Garfield County, Rosebud County is going to probably make up the, the lower end of that range. So uh, there are sales outside of that range, obviously, but uh, this is going to catch the vast majority of them. Dry crop has been my most stable market overall. Uh, we'll talk about there's uh, little sub markets in there that are going to suggest otherwise, but for the most part, that's been pretty, pretty stable. Pasture, that would be the obviously the biggest land class of eastern Montana and moderate increases overall. Not, nothing like western Montana. This is 
pretty boring after you saw the numbers for, for Western Montana, but it's, that's just kind of how Eastern Montana is, it's just steady as she goes. The, uh, the bottom table there is just general overview of sales activity. It's It's been busy. The number of sales verified for 2021 is only 89. That's not, it is in no way intended to show a, a decrease in market activity. That's just what Myron and I have got written up, verified. So uh, there, there's always a lag time in, in getting that information on there. So I think as, as time goes on, we're gonna see that 2021 was extremely busy. It felt like it's been extremely busy between appraisal activity and just sales. I also want to clarify that um, normally when we sort the data for this, it's based on 640 acres or higher. And I didn't do that this time. I, I sorted it based on the highest and best use of, of predominantly agricultural because there, there tends to be cropland sales that are smaller than that size range that I think are relevant <coughs> to the discussion. Okay, so irrigated crop. This is gonna show the last 10 years of data, and what I want to emphasize is that trend line, the black line at the top. Stable increases, just not, no big runaways, no big jumps. Um, you know, the big topic in eastern Montana for this past year was, was extremely dry conditions. Uh, I was kind of curious to, to watch the irrigated market to see you know, if there was gonna be any added pressure on that market from people trying to secure some sort of a hay base, but uh, nothing crazy observed. I don't know if that's gonna change as we go into 2022, it probably depends on the weather. But uh, you know that, that average for the whole region, uh, back in 2012, we were kind of in that $22, $2,300 range, and here we are, 2021, more in that uh, $2,600, $2,700 range. So over a 10 year span, that's it's pretty, pretty moderate increases, really. There's some ebbs and flows in there, but that's uh, where we're at. Okay, dry crop. Now, as I told you earlier, that uh, this was my most stable line class overall, and then it probably shows the steepest trend line. There's a, that's gonna be more of a reflection of, of busy activity on the far eastern counties. Revo County in particular, there's been a lot of activity with smaller tracts of dry crop that are being purchased by operators from North Dakota. Those dry crop values in North Dakota are quite a bit higher, and I think they, it was only a matter of time until they started catching on and coming into Montana and, and picking up some of that smaller stuff. So there's that's the area where I've done the most dry crop work the last two years, so therefore my sales are going to be reflecting a higher percentage of, of that information, so it's gonna it's gonna influence that trend line quite a bit. But overall, pretty steady. There's just not been a lot of activity. I, I don't know if that's gonna change with you know uh, wheat prices kind of coming alive in you know, the past year. But for the most part, um, sales are happening, and, and they're just not not a lot of excitement here, folks. <laughs> Can you say if that pressure from North Dakota is because of people continuing to spend oil revenue? Or is it just people that are looking for value? I would say, I, I don't know for sure in Richland County. I haven't seen a whole lot of that. That was a big topic for a long time, was that oil money. But I would say like in the Weibo area, it's more just the operators that are kind of getting priced out in North Dakota. And if they <coughs> just go a few miles west, they can pick up pretty similar ground for a lot less money. I, I'd say that's probably more of a driver. That's my opinion. Reserve the right to change that. <laughs> or if Lynn tells me it's not right. <laughs> what percentage neighbor and neighbor sales? There's a lot. There's a lot. And those are the hardest ones to verify because they don't often hit the market. So it's it's hard to get a handle on those, but that's that's probably one of the biggest drivers of, of what's happening in eastern Montana is people when people ask me what's one of the biggest drivers of value, I would say it's how bad your neighbor wants your place. So I mean that, that's a big component, and but it's, it's hard to capture all of that. Okay, so pasture values. Um, what this data includes is pure grass tracts. It includes ranches, 
and it includes larger combination units with a significant proportion of pasture. So again, it's just that, that trend line, it's just, it's increasing, but it's not, I mean, we're not doubling values like they talked about in other areas. I mean, it's just, it's just steady. There's a lot of demand for good quality grass. There's not a lot of inventory for people to find what they're looking for. But, uh, um, oh, something that I did know, um, it's been, a, it's been a few years, six, seven years, since we've really seen much of a premium for any type of recreational influence on that timbered rangeland that has some elk hunting amenity to it. And it seems like in 2021, there were a few sales that started to reflect some of that coming back into the market. Please don't think that, or take that to mean that we're having a runaway in Eastern Montana. That's not what I'm saying. That's the whole theme of this, is for me to tell you what's happening in Eastern Montana. It's not the same as Western Montana, but it does seem like that, so it's kind of glimmering back to life. So it would be interesting to see if that was just a, a just kind of an anomaly or if that's maybe coming back. And I saw that in two different areas. I saw it in the Missouri Grapes, and I also saw a little bit of that in Powder River County, so areas where people tend to hunt grow. I brought notes because I knew I'd get nervous and forget what I was going to talk about. Okay, so not a lot of people talk about ranch sales on a dollar per annual unit basis, but I do still get questions on it, and I do track the information, so I wanted to provide that to some of you who do care, I guess. Um, so I think that this trend line mirrors what we saw just with the pasture values in general. It's, it's just slow and steady increases. 2016, it looks like there's a drop there, and that would be the year that the bottom fell out of the cattle market. I don't think that that's really reflecting any drop in, in the ranch market. I think that what that's showing is just a very limited number of sales that actually happened that year. Um, but for the most part, I mean, it's we, we, 2014, we were just over that 12,000 bucks a head, and even now we're just slightly over 14,000. So pretty, steady growth, but not, not any big jump. Um, I will also add that all of the data that's included in this graph is it's all analyzed on a year-round capacity, so that we're, we're, cheap, we're comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So anyway, it's all um, year-round basis, and then also <coughs> it's, um, it's only 420 head and larger, so it kind of takes out that part-time farm. Yeah, any, any questions? Really count on some questions. It's hard to... Uh... I have a question for you. Yeah. So <clears throat> you might enlighten people on what an animal unit, what's the annual operation of an animal unit in Eastern Montana? Because over here we're used to five or six months of feeding hay. So I think... You would ask that, wouldn't you? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what, we, what I looked at this is, you know, this what it takes to run a cow for 12 months. So there's going to be uh, purely grazing units and there's also going to be those that have, uh, have hay base to it as well. So sometimes that's kind of figured on with three to four months of feeding cattle, but then there's also uh, some that's year-round grazing too. Is that, is that answering your question? How many acres do you run an animal unit in Eastern Montana? Depends on where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> so 30 to 40, I guess, is kind of the, the general rule of thumb, but you'll, you'll find exceptions to that. But. Percent of lease? Public lease, me? Yeah. Oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, man, I don't know. It, it, it's a big range. Um, I don't see a lot of, of majority lease places selling, so I would say, I don't know, 15, 20%. You kind of look like Jen Saki, so I'm just going to keep it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 so you're <leaving> yourself. <laughs> Are somewhat tied to quality, 
But again, that higher end of the range is, is influenced by other things besides just just production. You know, um, some of it is there's areas where there wasn't a lot of opportunity to expand, and then in the last couple of years, more of these little pieces have come up available. So there's just uh, some additional buyer motivation to it. Again, how bad does your neighbor want your place? Is, is the driver as much as, as anything? But there is there is a general trend of quality that that does seem to be reflected. And one final question. Um, are your buyers, your percent of buyers, out of state, in state? Do you have any feel for that? I would say most are, are in state, but that's not always true. Uh, the bigger places, would, the bigger the place, the more likely it is to be an out of state buyer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Then, units are they just cows or total? This would be what it takes to run a cow on a year round basis, so cow calf. What about the last year or so, I think I've seen more out-of-state owners kind of have the state people. Uh, uh, heirs, people have inherited stuff years ago, kept it, send it year after year, leased, and leases come due, they're just liquidating. So that's probably only the last year or so. I've seen more of that than I have in the past. What are people paying the least on an AUM? For AUM? Yeah. Uh, anywhere from 20 to $30 an AUM. On an AUM, or they, is that clear? Uh, but yeah, about the same thing as a Baker, Steve, can you repeat some of that on the mic so that it's caught on video? Just summarize what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but he's a joker. Okay. Um, I don't think I have a whole lot more unless there were more questions. I mean, it's basically things have been busy and Steady, stable, moderate growth. That's it. I tried to drag that out as long as I could. <laughs> I really don't know what else to go with this. So. Anyway, Thank um, you. I don't know how the rest of you feel, but this is kind of what the last two years have done to me. It's not a lot. Where'd you get that picture of Joe on the bottom? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you know what they say, in every big group of people, there's always one crazy person. <laughs> Looking around this room today, can't seem to pick them out. <laughs> Um, <laughs> anyway, my name is Wade McAlpine. I don't know if I should use this laser pointer or not, because if I do, Dave Heine might attack the screen and try to sit, sit tight here. All right. Anyway, yeah, I'm Wade McAlpine. I'm an appraiser with Farm Credit, kind of Great Falls. We'll be covering North Central Montana which consists of about 11 counties. Is there anybody in here that does mostly, mostly does work in North Central Montana? It's nobody, perfect, <laughs> so easy. <laughs> so it consists of 11 counties, Glacier, Tool, Liberty, Hill, Blaine. Byron Mall is kind of the godfather of Blaine County. Um, Andre, Teton, Cascade, Duke Basin, Ferguson, Shoal County. Right up here is where I grew up, and uh, I kind of laugh because whoever named Chicago the Windy City has obviously never been to Cut Bank. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this area also includes the Golden Triangle of Montana, which runs from uh, Great Falls up to Shelby, over to Haver, and back to Great Falls. So it's kind of this. This is kind of known as the Golden Triangle. Uh, I believe at one point it, it probably still is. Shoto County was the third largest wheat producing state in the nation. I think that's still the case, but I'm not totally sure. A lot of wheat raised up here. And, uh, north central Montana is more of a dry crop or small grains area compared to eastern Montana where it's cattle. 
But there are some cattle up here. And we also have the Rocky Mountain Front and several island ranges, island mountain ranges that exhibit some recreational influences. Here's kind of a table similar to what Christine had showing the kind of the range of values in North Central Montana. Um, granted, it's not gonna, there are sales both below and above these ranges, but this is, if anybody remembers the bell curve and statistics, this is where the majority of your market sales are gonna fall in these ranges. Um, irrigated crop, you kind of got three major areas for irrigation. Uh, you got the, the Fairfield Bench area right here, which is a big irrigation project. And then you have the Pondre County Canal and Reservoir Company up here around Lear and Conrad. Those are kind of your two major irrigation areas in central Montana. You also have some around Cut Bank on the Seville Flat, and then also along the Milk River and area river systems. But two of the, the two major ones are the PCCRC and the Fairfield Bench. Dry crop. Now, like Clark said, this is meant to be kind of a trend analysis more so than a specific property. So this is looking at the 11 counties in north central Montana in aggregate. So, because there's so many micro, what I like to call micro market areas in north central Montana. Tool County is always a good example I'd like to use. If you go to northern Tool County, above what they call the Keevan Rim, which is a geographical feature if you get above the Cuban Rim, kind of along the Canadian border, that's historically a higher rainfall area, then you tend to see some higher dry crop sales above the Cuban Rim. And then you drop below the Cuban Rim, even just a couple miles, and the quality decreases significantly. You have more alkali and uh, less rainfall. So these, these tables here encapsulate all those areas. So there's so many micro market areas within there that that's why the the ranges are fairly wide. And the pasture range here, this is for non-rec. So you're just, just your straight egg pasture. Hey, Wade. Yeah. That dry crop area north of the Keegan Rim, was that before or after the sale? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know, it's too early to tell. As far as I know, the semis haven't left. So this graph is for dry crop. If you look, the green columns are for the median dollar per acre. The purple columns are the average or mean price per acre. The red line is simply the number of sales it's based upon. Now these sales don't include smaller, smaller sales. I think these are all above 40 acres. And then uh, your trend lines here, are probably the most important thing to look at. Purple is for the average. And the green is for the median. But anyway, this shows over 10 years, back to 2012, and you can see it's been kind of a steady increase. Not a huge increase, just steady to slightly increasing over the years. Back in 2012, your average dry crop price is pretty close to 800 to 900 bucks an acre. And fast forward to 2012, your average price is a little over 1,200. So, and again, that Keevan area, below the Keevan Rim, you're gonna be way lower, but if you get to Above the Keeping Rim or like Geraldine area, which is higher quality crop ground, those are going to be your upper end sales. So those are all melded into one, which is why your average was over 1,200. Any questions on that so far? Might be worth noting 2021. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. The verification lag, you can see 2021, there's not as many sales that have been verified. Uh, it's due to those sales have transpired, but just might not have them verified yet. Or if you do have them verified, they might be on the database. So this is just what we have on the database at this time. Uh, demand for all land types remains strong. And I think that's from years of good profitability back in 2013. In four, 2012 and 13, it was a pretty good grain market. And so there's a lot of larger operators in this area that have still had money in the bank and can buy these pieces of ground when they come up. And uh, to Clark's point, a lot of the purchasers in this area, there's not too many drag crop properties hit the market. A lot of these are neighbor to neighbor deals or landlord tenant deals. So there's not a whole lot of drag crop sales that are actually on open market or drag crop properties. So. 
it'd be interesting if, if every single one, if every single dry crop sale, or every single dry crop property had been on the market, I would imagine every single one of these columns would be quite a bit higher, but that's just speculation. So I did have, I originally had an irrigated crop slide in there, but there was very limited data. We get back to that verification way. Um, it was showing a lot of the 2020 transactions for irrigated sales involved a lot of tenant sales and other non-market transactions. And then 2021 uh, data that we have on our database, a lot of it was in Payne County, which is historically lower than say Fairfield, Lynch, or Monterey County, now in reservoir company. So the irrigated crop chart that I built based on that data, it went up to 2019 and then it showed a sharp decline, which is absolutely not the case. So that was a little misleading. So I decided to not even put that chart in there because irrigated crop is not is not decreasing. Moving on to agricultural pasture. Uh, like I said, north central Montana is not as big of a cattle area as eastern Montana. So there's a lot, not, not as many sales out there. And here in the pasture track sales are kind of like finding gold. They're just not, they're few and far between. So a lot of these sales will have some crop ground associated with them and some usable pasture, kind of a diversified operation, small grains and, and cow calf. Um, so the, the pasture sales data is limited, but as you can see with these trend lines, it is steady, steadily uh, increasing, just not huge increases because you don't have your recreational influence like you do in Southwest Montana. But there are, in 2021, there are some sales. I don't know that they're on our database yet, but there's some sales that are higher than than uh, 2020. So there's there's some some increases going on there. Moving on to recreational pasture. Uh, again, North Central Montana is less of a recreationally influenced area than Southwest Montana. But we do have the Rocky Mountain Front and those island mountain ranges, the Highwood Mountains and the uh, Bears Paw Mountains, Sweetgrass Hills, but there's not been a whole lot of sales activity in that area for bigger places. There might be some neighbor deals, you know, that are purchased by operators for running cows on and they don't really care about the bulk on them and whatnot. So the inventory on the market at this point for recreational, big recreational ranches in North Central Montana is somewhat limited. Even so, the Lewistown area has been pretty hot the last couple of years. And you can see these trend lines here are quite a bit steeper than the, the straight egg pasture trend lines. And a lot of that is from mid-2020 forward with the COVID buying and the COVID fears. That's it had a lot to do with it. And that, like I say, that Lewistown area right around there is kind of getting discovered. It's kind of like a white sulfur springs type area, smaller cow town. But more people are moving in and discovering it. And we're really seeing a lot of strong sales in that area. So 2012 here, and this slide does not include like riparian or river bottom pasture. This is just your straight uh, upland timber covered recreational pasture. I took the, the riparian, because a lot of these recreational ranches will have the irrigated base with it too. And so this is just looking at the pasture. Okay, this slide here shows the average dry crop price from 2012 forward to 2021. And the red line is your is your wheat price for those years. And that's directly from the National Egg Statistics Service. So back in 2012, 2013, and in 14, the grain markets were pretty strong. And you can see these the, uh, it wasn't until about 2014 into 2015 that, that uh, wheat prices were dropping down. Then from 2015 on, it was it looks like uh, a fairly steep decrease here, but if you look over here, four to five bucks a bushel, it's, it just kind of hovered in that range for quite a few years, like 2015 to 2020. 2021, grain prices really, beginning in January, kind of started about 550 bushel right in there and they really increased throughout the year 
into, into December. And in December 2021, the, the wheat price was at 8.58 a bushel, which is the highest it's been since approximately November 2012, when it was 8.47 a bushel. So if, if wheat prices had stayed, continued to stay at about this level, this red trend line would be quite a bit steeper than it is. And it should act, if, if it wasn't for the increase in 2021, so it should almost, that's where trend lines can be a little tricky because it should, you know, corner in here and start going up. But if it wasn't for the increase in grain prices, this red line would be a heck of a lot steeper than it is. So, any questions there? Oh, one thing I wanted to mention too, even though uh, grain prices are pretty strong at the moment, input prices have also gone up significantly. So it's gonna be, it's a little too early to tell right now how how that's going to affect the market if grain prices and input prices both stay strong the, you might see continue to see strong sales for dry crop now if input prices go back down and grain prices continue to go up we might see a significant increase the opposite can also happen too when the, if the input prices stay high and the grain prices get back down you're going to see your buying pool and into the larger operators that have liquidity that can absorb those purchases for your investor types. You're, if the input prices stay high and the dry crop prices, or the grain prices go down, your smaller operators are probably gonna maybe not be buying as much land. So it's too early to tell at this point how that could affect the, the dry crop market. Any questions so far? What about other rights? Other rights you're buying? Other rights you're buying, yes. There are some of the larger operators that, especially in North Central Montana, they're, uh, everybody's competing with the Hutterites. And then we've also seen some other non-Hutterite large operators that are starting to, they're not too happy about that. So they're starting to figure out other ways to compete with them. And that's where there's a large dry crop farmer up in that area that has kind of been working with an investment firm out of Florida. They, but he works with them, negotiates the deal, they buy the ground and he farms it. And that's kind of a way to compete with the Hutterites. The Hutterites are pretty strong operators. And uh, that's what's driving a lot of them strong dry crop prices in North Central Montana. Any great Not that I know of. There's that one at Cut Bank that uh, is relatively new, but I think that just got bought out. That's a few years old now, but I think it got bought out last year. Is that right, Brenda? But nothing, nothing new that I'm aware of beyond that. How about the APR? What kind of activity you seen there? You know, that, uh, yeah, that's kind of more for Steen's area over there, but that Fergus County, they're, especially, they just bought that big place on the Muscle Shell, I think. And that, that's kind of the first big transaction lately that I'm aware of, but they're definitely causing a stir in that area. You got anything to add on that, Steen? That's good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the appraisal's fault. <laughs> Just remember that rule of thumb. So uh, we're going to go into the Western Montana market area. Uh, same kind of deal in our a little cheesy map. Uh, but we're gonna focus on Western Montana now. On this, when we look at Western Montana, these are the top 10 counties in terms of dollar volume. 89% of the dollar volume came out of these counties. Uh, they accounted for 69% of the total sales transactions. We keep pulling Fergus County and it doesn't really look like it belongs, but uh, just kind of same, similar market influences, the recreational, the why not. But, uh, so <clears throat> it's supposed to be Western Montana, uh, but obviously. It's supposed to be western, but it's going to be really focusing on southwestern. Um, I had another slide in here, but it didn't make it. I mean, there are more observations, but I mean, most of the data came from southwestern Montana, just because it's been so so active here. So anyway, we'll get started. Uh, again, it's pretty similar to the first table I showed you. Uh, all the properties, 40 acres in size and greater. Just two search criteria, size and location. Um, 
In 2021, you'll see that 361 sales. Again, looks down, but it'll take time. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if we meet or exceed what we saw in 2020. Just gonna take time to gather the sales. Uh, $1.5 billion, more or less. So that's the majority of the sales data that we have. I think it was one seven or something. Uh, when I gave you the state overview, uh, it's a 51% increase uh, and came at only a 33% increase in the total acres sold. <clears throat> Pretty similar to what we saw in 2020. Uh, we exceeded a billion dollars, uh, sold 411 acres, so 58% increase in dollar volume and only a 47% increase in acres. Um, <clears throat> if we look at average size in 2019, we're at 688 acres. The median sale price is $680,000. So uh, <clears throat> that was up about 5%. 2020, uh, up a little bit on average size, 10% increase in median sales price is 750. Uh, but in 2021, again, we saw a pretty big jump in average size, uh, a 62% increase in median sales price at 1.2 million, more or less. So if you remember on the state overview, it was like 975,000. So most of that increase, obviously, we're seeing here in Western Montana. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we break it up. I've got this lower end, 40 to 640, and we'll look at the 640 and above later. Uh, <clears throat> same. Measures, uh, number of transactions, volume, dollars and acres, percentage change in both of those measures. Uh, 2020, uh, 272 sales, about $454 million uh, in total dollar revenue, 51,000 acres. Uh, so we saw a 5% increase in dollar revenue, but a 21% decrease in the number of acres sold. Again, that's going to change as we move. but. It does show a pretty significant increase uh, when you think about a 21% decrease in acres and a 5% increase on uh, the total dollar volume. <clears throat> pretty similar in uh, 2020 at 435 million, uh, 65,000 acres, 38% uh, increase and down 7% in acres. So, uh, both, again, pretty strong indicators of the increase in values throughout the region. Uh, if we look at average size, it's 215 acres in 2019, $503,000 median sales price. Uh, it's up about 16% coming out of 2018. Uh, in 2020, we saw a 6% increase in median sales price out of 535. Kind of a slight decrease in average size, but <clears throat> nothing earth shattering. Uh, in 2021, we saw a 47% increase in the median sales price uh, to $787,000. So we look at all this stuff and all the data is telling us increases. I like to look at other sources. Uh, of course, we'll get to the other sources after we talk about one more slide of my sources. But this is median uh, unimproved land values. Again, just trying to focus on the land values. Uh, we see median and average. Uh, 2019, we saw a 5% increase in median, 13 in average. 2020, 61 in median and 72% in average. Uh, 2021, 39 and 48. So again, just a different measure, same data, increasing trends. And this is the other data source. I uh, pulled this from the Big Sky F County up there, but it's country NLS. Um, and it's just looking at unimproved uh, vacant land tracts from Gallatin County. Uh, it's just vacant land sales. I mean, that was the only search criteria on it. Uh, the blue backgrounds, acres, the bars represents total dollars. Uh, you look at 2015 to even into 2019, pretty steady in terms of dollars and acres. Uh, 2020 and 2021, we saw some pretty big increases, uh, both in acres and dollars. Uh, in 2021, it was a 65% increase in dollars and only a 41% increase in uh, acres. So, uh, different data source, same results. And this is just median, the median sales price of those vacant land tracts. Um, <clears throat> I just thought it'd be interesting to look at this. And, uh, you can see, obviously, uh, increases throughout that uh, 2020 to 2021. Uh, that looks like a, almost a 76% increase in the median uh, sales price of these tracts. It's a real wide range. I mean, I didn't sort for size or anything. It's just if you guys entered it as vacant land sale in Gallatin County, I pulled it. So. But if you look from 2018 to 2021, that three-year period, uh, you'd have to appreciate from 2018 to 2021, 38.7% annually. But three years prior to that, 2015 to 2018, would have been 17.6, so just a real big period of growth. 
Um, I looked in outlying areas, uh, so went east, looked in Park County, same pole, vacant land, sales. I just <clears throat> thought it'd be interesting to see what's happening. I know most of us focus on larger properties, but again, you know, pretty significant increases uh, in median sales price. The average days on market fell off pretty sharply in 2021, which I thought maybe result because you could buy a, a track for 150,000 instead of 400,000. Um, again, 2018 to 2021, that annual appreciation rate over those three years would be 17.3 uh, compared to 2015 to 2018, which would be less than 1%. <clears throat> so then I went west and looked at that area around Wheat, Montana, which uh, coming out of 2000, like 2008, 2009, seemed like it was pretty well dead. Um, obviously, it's increased a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Same time period, 2018 to 2021. Um, you look from 2019 to 2020, the median sales price was up 38%. 2018 to 2019, 31. So it started a little further back, but in 2020 to 2021, it shows it's up 82% in that area. Um, in that three year time period, from 2018 to 2021, would be 48.3% uh, versus an, almost a negative, well, essentially a negative uh, growth rate the prior three years. So, I mean, you have people moving out of the Gallatin County trying to find something more affordable. I don't really think we've seen that in the ranch market yet. That's kind of why, you know, areas in eastern Montana haven't seen the growth. I think in that, the last rental we had, you know, people were selling, still under beef producers, you know, coming out of Beaverhead County, moving to eastern Montana. I just don't, I don't think the sellers are uh, the same, obviously. Uh, you think about some of the people that sell those places, they're, they didn't sell to go replace it, they just sold to get out and take advantage of it. So now we'll go to the 640 and greater, uh, again, western, southwestern Montana. We had, uh, <clears throat> in 2021, I had 89 transactions in our data set at over a billion dollars. Um, <clears throat> so pretty significant increase when you compare to 600 million in 2020. So up 84% and uh, we sold 495,000 acres and that was up about half of uh, the increase in total dollar. <clears throat> so that's pretty, I thought that was pretty interesting. 2019 average size was 2,500 acres more or less. Median sales price is about 2.3 million. Uh, coming out of 2018, that was a 14% increase. 2020, we're at 3,000 acres, so not a lot of change. Uh, median sale price of about 2.8, an increase of 23%. And in 2021, it looks like a 50% increase in these median sales prices. Uh, at 4.2 million, but the average size came up as well. I mean, we're at 5,500 acres and change, um, so everything increased size and median sale price. <clears throat> Last time we gave this talk, I remember showing this, kind of thinking we'd figured something out, trying to compare what we were experiencing in 2014 to 2019, reflecting back on 20, 2001 to 2009. Kind of looked like we had something figured out, and then we laughed at the next couple of years, it pretty well blows. <laughs> not out of the real thing. <laughs> so I put all that together, the percentage change uh, on the graph, which is what I think is interesting. When you look at 2019, both measures, dollars and acres, decreased, but there wasn't that big a disparity, you know, 26% versus 13 and a half. Uh, 2020, uh, both were positive. But yeah, it's 76%, 65% roughly. So not a lot of disparity. Uh, but in 2021, we got 1.1 billion and 495,000 acres. So we had an 84% increase in total dollar volume uh, and only a 43% increase in the total number of acres. So uh, I guess I just keep saying it, but obviously some upward price pressure. And this is dollar per acre, unimproved land values. I got from 2012 uh, to 2021. Uh, 2007 was what we used to report as the pre peak, and it was about $1,900 an acre in Western Montana. Obviously, we met that in 2018 and have maintained uh, that growth trend. In 2012, it was 776 acres. 2021 is $2,543. <clears throat> That's about a 227% increase in that nine year period. Uh, typically when we look at resales, we think it probably might double in 10 years. Um, so that's pretty 
a pretty rapid rate of growth. If we look at longer trends, after this slide, uh, again, this is one where we kind of had the same thing, but uh, just keeps going up, so it hasn't come down yet. So longer term trends, we got from 1990 to 2021, and I just, you know, I look at this and wondered if we could relate it uh, to a typical business cycle. We have expansion, peak, depression, trough. You know, if you look, coming out of the 80s, so 90 to 2003 could be uh, your recovery. <clears throat> 2004 to 2008 uh, would be your expansion, your peak, and subsequent you know, decline, the trough, 2019 to 2013, more or less. And then 2013 uh, to 2017 could be your expansion. And then right now we're in, a, obviously, an expansion period. Uh, not recovery would have been 20, about 2013, 2013 to 20, 2016. Anyway, that condensed the time period, too. So, but, so to 1990 to 2003, coming out of the 80s, kind of the recovery, the expansion and peak that we experienced in 2000, 2008, when we fell off a cliff, uh, entered that kind of trough era. 2013 started to have that rec uh, recovery. Uh, and then 2017 to 2019, the expansion. And right now in 2020 and 2021, it looks like we'll have a continued expansion. It's kind of like Andy said. I mean, I do think, I don't know that we'll have to see much more price pressure. I mean, I, I just don't think buyers, uh, they're gonna be pretty resistant right now. And it's just gonna be tough to find those properties. But I mean, there is gonna be some, some friction in coming back down because you're gonna be dealing with sellers who wanna get that price, even if that's not what it's worth. Uh, so it's gonna take a little while for that to settle. But right now, in terms of, I guess, dollar per acre, you know, it looks like we're, maybe we're at a peak, maybe we're still expanding, but I don't think we'll fall off a cliff uh, next year or this year. Okay, that's all I have. Hey, everybody. Tom Kingsbury, I am the owner and operator of Park and Parcel in Montana, which is a mapping service that's utilized by a number of uh, brokers and appraisers here, fair amount of folks in the room here. We're going to talk about some some of the data that we use that's available statewide and how you can use it to your advantage and show off some some maps that we've been finding uh, useful and uh, some other goodies here. So let's take a look. <coughs> so I'm talking about what data that we've been using is Montana has some really good GIS data and it's not just you know, putting it on the map. A lot of this data is tabular. And you can bring it in to your Excel and you can work with this data, even if you're not a map guru or however you want to turn it. The other stuff that you can look at is the uh, camera data. Now, typically, it seems like most folks are familiar with the cadastral website and that data and how it's presented in there. It's typically as just one single record that you're looking at at a time. So you're painting a parcel seeing the owner and the address, <coughs> seeing the deed information, you look to see if there's dwellings, look at the land classes. You can see that there's conservation easement, but you don't really get much data off of this site about those easements. This data is also, like I said, available in a tabular format. So you can sort by the owner name, you can sort by the address, and you can start to pick up things that you might not know if you're just looking and pinging around on a map, or if you perhaps are in a new area, you're unfamiliar with the project that you're working on. So in this example, um, we have Kipton Ranch Co. And if you're just Google, or if you're just searching that, you might not come up with Kipton Ranch Co. Incorporated, Kipton Ranch Company, or even you know a, a misvesting there with an LLC at the end. Or you can look at the address. You can notice that there might be some additional family lands that you want to make sure that you're uh, taking in. So you don't need a map program to look at the stuff. You can get right onto your Excel. So and along with this, when you have it in your Excel, you can total up the acres of your selected parcel. You can create a legal description based upon that instead of having to copy and paste or however people are choosing to create these legals. You can also identify if there's improvements by simply seeing that there's a building value you can go back and pull that single cadastral sheet. 
Um, here's an example on a project we were looking at recently. You notice that there is a Houston address on this 320 ranch along with a rather tax address. And if you're ignoring that, you may think that your subject looks like this, but in fact, there is additional ground up in here that's under that same address that you may need to address. And it could be under more than one nesting, depending on how people like to play things. So coming back to this cadastral site, if you wanted to play around with this data, you can go up to the data tab and head to this site here and grab either the county of interest or statewide. And the easiest way to do it is grabbing the shape file. And when you, when you download that zip, inside of it is a number of files that are all named the same. In the mapping program, it works to display the data along with the tabular data. But if you just want to look at the tabular data, that .dbf file that's sitting in there, you can just open that up in Excel and start working with the data. So there is the statewide in, in Excel just showing that there. So you can do some also cool stuff though if you choose to start experimenting with the GIS data. And there's some open source mapping programs that are available out there if you want to dig in. And some of the here's some of the uh, things that we've been looking at that might be useful or something that we might not consider. If you look at they have historic data as well, so it's not just the most current cadastral, you can pull data from a year ago. <coughs> So if you were working in, this is the Jack Creek area, here uh, heading down towards Ennis from uh, Moonlight. And if you had a project in here, it might, might behoove you to know that in the last year that there was another 28 parcels created. Because <coughs> you might see them with the newest cadastral data, but if you didn't compare it to the year before, you might not realize that that type of activity is happening, and that might be important. Or not, I don't know, but some people think it is. <coughs> The other thing that we've been doing is connecting the, the camera data to uh, the cadastral data to filter certain deed types to look for uh, market transactions that might not be appearing or being exposed to the market. So these are all, this is filtered for warranty deeds and things of conveyance and those of purchaser's interest, et cetera. And, oh, and it's popping out potential sales and transactions in 2021. So if you're working in an area that you're not familiar with, it might be useful to have a foothold before you just start cold calling people and asking what's been happening out here. You know, you could say, you take this data, you can see a warranty deed connected to it here, you ping around, if you have e-title, you can pull that up right from your desk. Instead of going to the courthouse and looking at a deed and saying, I think this is important, and then trying to map it and see. Going the opposite way, you can see what is in your area and what might be of interest before going on that use chase. This is a, another interesting map that we were playing around with. Uh, this is a parcel density map. So the more cut up the ground is, the more parcels there are in the area, the, the hotter, the redder the map is, right? So you can kind of see developmental and development influence, some of the CEs pushing back against development. So sometimes this might be an important factor to be able to help explain maybe what's happening in your area, or if you're right on the edge of the development. Um, we've talked a lot about inventory today, and uh, we've had some clients reach out looking for customizing the way that they reach out to people. Instead of just sending a generalized mailer, perhaps you want to know, you know, I want to know about the owners in this example is Carbon County. This client wanted to know about people who were on these major rivers and creeks who were over a certain acreage. So you can take that GIS data, and from that you can derive a set of the owners that have background. So you can send a mailer out, or you can contact them based upon those factors, whether it's against the forest, or if they have an holding property, or whatnot. These other additional properties over here that are popping up were larger properties that are non-contiguous with pieces on the on the water there. So that's what you're seeing in this map. This is a heat value interpolation map from a couple of years ago. I still like it and we're still doing things like this. Um, 
taking known data points of sales and expanding them across with their neighbors so you're using the whole data set to kind of create some trend data. So you can see that this was still in, before Belgrade was starting to take off a few years ago. This would, I, re, I tried to rerun it, but some of the, uh, the data was a little not entered correctly. It was taking quite a bit to massage it to get all the points mapped correctly, since there was a, quite a bit of volume, I thought. Taking all the errant ones out and just using what was easy wasn't going to get the correct picture. So this is just for more of an example. This is kind of neat. Um, this is LiDAR data. This is a Bitterroot Valley, got Corvallis right here. Um, they shot this. LiDAR is, uh, they, they fly over, they have it on a big pole in a truck, and they shoot a laser down, and it bounces back, and they can create very detailed elevation data. So we're starting to see a push for this in for doing flood hazard um, studies. So this data is going to be coming more and more available, and it can really help. And there's some roads and rivers there, just to kind of give more context. But I mean, you can see the channels. You can really see a lot of the detail coming in. So, for example, if an aerial with the older shaded relief of like a 10 meter, you know, it starts to tell the story. But this new data. It's night and day. And that's also going to help create more high quality slope maps, um, maps where you can say, what can I see from my building site? You know, what are my neighbors going to see if I build my house here? That type of uh, view shed analysis. All this data is becoming more and more available. And you can answer a lot more questions perhaps from your desk, where it seems like a lot more folks are probably work in these days before they head out. It's good to arm yourself with as much data as you can, I guess. Um, so this was something that we were chatting about when we were talking about inventory. And I uh, thought I'd look at how much land in the last 10 to 12 years has kind of gone back to state and federal agencies. So this is from 2009, the Swan Valley. and. Uh, between then and 2022, all this shaded ground, and, and all the greens of US Forest Service have just shaded all the public ground the same color, just to kind of make it easier on the, on the mind. All this shaded black went back to state and federal. Now the swan looks remarkably different today than it did in 2009 for what is available. Same here, uh, west of Missoula in the Fish Creek area, all this ground went back state and federal. East of Missoula, same, same deal. So when we talk about inventory, it's not always just these longer holes, but also some of the stuff that federal agencies might be going after. So here's kind of a full back view, 2009, all the ground. And statewide, um, between 2009 and 2022, Approximately 730,000 acres uh, went back to state and federal agencies. So if you look at that in combination with conservation easements, Western Montana is getting a little harder to find perhaps an unencumbered piece of larger size. Which I was joking that maybe you want to move into like a virtual space can buy some virtual real estate, maybe if things are getting too crazy. Um, it's non-fungible token stuff, NFTs, people buying pictures of art for millions of dollars on the internet, just it's blowing people's minds. And looking at it from a mapping point of view, I was kind of always drawn into some of this virtual real estate. This is what they call the sandbox. And this is kind of, I think about it as like commercial virtual real estate. So you got these companies like Sean the Sheep and Atari and The Walked in Dead and Snoop Dogg buying up these pieces of ground and they're, they're building virtual experiences. And if you, it's like a social hub. And these little tiny squares are 96 meters by 96 meters, about 2.3 acres. So you can go in, you can get a pass and hang out with Snoop Dogg and see an exclusive concert, or go to a pop-up boutique of fancy clothes and get something sold to you virtually and then get sent to you in real life. I don't know, there's a lot of really weird, crazy stuff going. 
What if you want to buy it? I checked, I checked it out yesterday. The least expensive piece of land on the market right now is about $12,300. It's about $5,500 an acre for that little square right there. Seems like a good deal. <laughs> Not financial advice. But yeah, I think things are, uh, I don't think this is going away. And while this might be the Ask Jeeves of the Yahoo's in 10 years, if anybody remembers that search engine, um, you, know, I, you know, it's hard to say what's gonna win out. But these public distributed ledgers that's gonna be eliminating these third party verifications isn't going away. So whether or not you're tracking cows or grain, you know, having it on a ledger that everybody's agreed upon where the numbers can't be fudged, seems to be where things are going. People are putting whole cities of deeds on there, so there's no title issues, and you can just look and say, hey, this deed's clear and good, and it's already been verified, and you can be in another country and start bidding on it. So, some pretty interesting implications. And it's probably worth keeping an eye on. I don't know about this project in particular, but who knows? And uh, that's about all I got, so. Does that have a does that reference to some part of the earth? No, nope. this is this is literally just all virtual. Now, there's other projects like like the Upland, with, which we looked at before. That they'll take all the existing parcels of say San Francisco and make it a monopoly game. You can buy a you know a famous piece of property and hold on to it or sell it or horse trade with it or whatever. And uh, but you own property in San Francisco. I do, yeah. I own a few pieces in San Francisco. I just I bought a I bought a property for like five dollars and sold it for like 150 the other day. <laughs> Weirdest thing ever. It's just a little square. I don't know. Once again, not financial advice, but it's it's kind of interesting. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. There we go. It's a new ranch order. Okay, um, I just kind of wanted to talk about some things that I've been thinking about since I'm not really doing much valuation these days. Mike and Corey have kind of taken over the valuation part and I just get to sit around and cook coupons now. So, um, you know, I've watched this land market over the last 40 years and I've wondered about what makes it go around and, you know, what, how we're going to make our money going forward. Um, and I thought that then Monopoly game was kind of a good analogy of that. But before we get to that, um, you know, part of what's driven this market to where it is, you know, is that we got fishing guides. I mean, Faye started in 1995. And then you're going to see what I'm talking today. He was right on the cusp of when it all happened. You know, and I still think of Faye as Faye. That's Faye Ranches. You know, what's driving this market? We're having annual prayer meetings. <laughs> The Fair Ranches is involved in, and Tim Murphy happened to be at that one. So, you probably didn't know that President Trump had a spiritual advisor. Guess who it is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, all in all, people wonder how, how are we in this market? How are people spending a billion dollars? And how does this all work? I mean, not only has the market become complicated, but these companies have become big and complicated, and they're all here for the most part. You know, Bozeman's kind of the epicenter. So Tom and I were looking at some of the new ads that people are using, because people are now going on the virtual web to sell real estate. So they're getting rid of some of their old profiles. They're going for a new, you know, more, <laughs> you know, reflects the demographics of the changing country, you know, and when they're on the web, you know, it's over it. So uh, Vinny, yeah, so you know, here's here's the standard old broker photo. You know, I got a fish, I killed something. This is <laughs> much more sophisticated, you know, wine drinking with glasses. So I think we're gonna see more of this. You see this, you have to go on the virtual web to see this. Um, Joel, yeah. I mean, look at that. That's the guy I wanna buy a ranch from. But if I'm a 30 year old millennial, I don't want to buy a ranch from that guy. <laughs> I need somebody that's more debonair. So, so not you know, landscape's changing. These guys are changing. It's just getting kind of crazy. Nice. I like that. So, 
So anyway, I started thinking about land transfers pre-2000, post-2000. Tom pulled this up. So through that deep magic of his, the black is pre-2000, the red is post-2000. These were properties over 5,000 acres that showed a deep trench. But all not necessarily a sale, because sometimes they're a family corporation or something, or inheritance or something. So I took it down to 10,000 acres. Ranches that are 10,000 acres or greater. And that's what I wanted to start thinking about. So I went through and looked at the ranches that had sold. And this isn't a complete list, but um, recently. And during the year they were bought. Because I've always talked about in the appraisals that the average hold time of these ranches is somewhere around 20 to 30 years. So I wanted to see if that data proved out. So when I look at properties that have recently sold, um, there was 25, and these are the big ranches, over 10,000. The average hold time was 24 years. 68% of those sales occurred in that kind of sweet spot of 15 to 30 years, with an average of 23 years. So as a broker, that's what I want to be looking for, I think, in this market of people that have held their ranches 20 to 30 years. And I call these the chips, because these were created in the 90s when Montana families would still sell because they would sell because they could trade up. But starting in about 2000, there's no Montana ranches selling. I mean, there's a few, you can say, yeah, the CA selling, but the CA wasn't, you know, it was the Anderson family ranch for two generations, but it was really bought by Buck Anderson in 1960 from Pack River Timber Company. It's a chip. You don't see the Galts, you don't see the Siebens, Morgans, whatever those names are. Those ranches do not sell. They went broke in the 80s, some of them got wiped out, but since that's when we saw the family transfers where there's some of those families, but since then, those ranches just don't come on the market. And people tend to think of these ranches as being historic Montana ranches, but they're not, they're monopoly chips. There were six sales that didn't fit the matrix. Two of them were estate sales, one was a family corp, one was two were investors that were upgrading, so they sold sooner than you would have expected. One had legal problems. So then I looked at the ranches that have been bought, and those ones that have kind of maturing are in the pink here, that sold you know, in the last 10 or 12 years. SRI, Hamilton, Inbar, Wilkes. And then these are the ranches, which I'm not gonna show you all its names, <laughs> that I say are in prep, okay? So we're tracking 28 properties now, and since I've been working on this, I've come up with about another seven. But there's five of those properties that are an average hold of 40 years, and I think two of them are already sold this year. And these are the ranches that I would expect you want to go talk to when you start trying to identify where you're going to find your inventory. Things to ponder. As we talked about, the investor started in earnest in 1990s, Turner bought in 1988. That's kind of when this thing started to happen, but in the 90s, it was a combination of Montana ranchers selling and outside investors coming in. And that's what I say, they created these chips. The speculation ended in 2000. I mean, it started more in earnest, and that's when the Montana people backed out because they couldn't sell their ranch and trade up or get something better. And that continues to be a problem we've heard expressed here today. Um, the operators, the Tommy Lanes, they came back in in 2011 and 12, and they set the floor when the market went in the tank. And they were 60% below market. That was that trough we saw today. We had a trough like that in the 80s, but we didn't have the speculators in there at the 80s. It was more run Montana ranch families that actually got crushed by PCA and other people, you know, because they just couldn't pay 17% interest. We didn't see any investors sell. None of these chips sold during the recession. What sold were leveraged properties that people had bought and hadn't put much money in. When we look at those big 10,000 acre ranches that are being bought by these capable people, they just sat back and waited. This is what I was referring to earlier. In the 80s, you know, if you were in trouble, you took the cure. Most of these Montana ranch families that have these big ranches, there's no debt. Very little debt. 
cash buyers that we're seeing now, they're not necessarily rate sensitive. And most of them leverage, they know they pay cash, but then they still leverage. This I thought was interesting when I looked at those 20, 30 year holds. The initial buyers of those ranches were willing to accept little to no return. But as they start to move into the trusts and the estates, that's in that 20, 30 year period when people start saying, you know, that's not making any money and it's worth a lot of money. Maybe we should get rid of it. Unless it has fishing. The heirs will hold on to a fishing property for another 20 or 30 years, <laughs> which I thought was weird. They don't come up, they come up even less. Obsolescence was referred to earlier about buildings. Um, there's much less discount on buildings. Um, overall rates are eight to 10%. If you look at these sales that are selling at 20 or 30 years, that's about what their overall annual rate of return is on top of whatever tax benefits they might have got, a lot of them were put under CD, things like that. So this was an interesting sale this year, and I don't know if that's the right sale price, um, but it's somewhere in that range. So Murdoch, he's worth $21 billion. He bought the Matador and Moissant for $275 million. And so that's about 1.3% of his wealth and after he leveraged it less than 1%. So I look at that and I'm like, what the hell does that mean? That means that if I'm Don Bannon and I have a million dollars, that would cost me $3,900. And after I leveraged it, I only have $1,170 in that ownership based on my net worth. People tell me it costs 10% to run something like that, so let's say He's got a $275 million asset. He's going to have to pump $27 million a year into it to buy trucks and pay the cowboys and all that. But to you, your million dollar, it's going to cost you $390 a year to run that thing. So, so we wonder why these values are so crazy. And, and that's what I try to think about. So what, what do these really mean to these people that are buying these ranches? I mean, it's, I don't know. You tell me. Now this is an interesting slide. <laughs> That's a painting I have in my house. It's called Three Buttons Down. But I just thought of Mike when I saw that because he's riding that CA pony until it drops. <laughs> so, you never, yeah, I said, you know, these people, that's my prediction, they'll never sell. At least not in my lifetime, which isn't probably that much longer. But things are changing, you know. You never know who's coming up. I mean, Chance had half the listing on the Matador. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, changing landscape. Federal government takeouts, Tom referenced that. I have some slides, I don't have to go to those. Mormon Church, buying stuff, they're not gonna sell. The Hutterites, they're more farm-oriented. Prairies are boom. <laughs> <laughs> So these were just kind of what Tom had already showed you. But oh yeah, those are kind of, I mean, these were additional ones I had in bulk. There's Big Sky. So this was the trade in the 90s or the 80s that created, Blixith traded all this stuff to get that stuff to create Big Sky. But I said, don't do this because you'll end up in jail like Tim. Um, that was before USPAP. We did the appraisal on that. They flew us back to Washington, D.C. at night. We went and met with the head of the Forest Service, had a napkin with some numbers on it. We testified before Congress. Boom, done. That kind of stuff will never happen again. But that's the way it used to get done. Crazy Mountains, same thing. There's a lot of this land going away. Madison Valley, there's conservation easements in the Madison Valley. So, Appreciate you coming, listening to my rantings. Arlen, or not Arlen, um, Gold's got a little more information for you, and then you guys get a superb lunch. And those of you that are staying, get some excellent uh, educational opportunities to the American Society. And what a great life. I appreciate everybody. Thank you.